All right, so the plan here is to do sort of a walkthrough of most of the Onion Core code um, or over a series of lectures. I'm not sure exactly how long it will take. We'll see as we go along. And I'll record everything for the benefit of, of people who are not in the room or in the conference now. Uh, if you have any questions while I talk, please just speak up and I'll, I'll try to answer them as we go along. I know some of this stuff will be very well known to some of you, but I'm trying to sort of cover, cover everything um, for the benefit also of future people who come into Stingray and wanna, wanna know about stuff. So, <clears throat> and this first lecture, I'm gonna do like an, a general overview of, of the, the core Indian code and also have a look at memory. So as all of you on this call know, we're divided into three main teams, core, rendering, and tools. So tools is pretty self-explanatory. Rendering is everything that has to do with, with rendering. And core is the rest. So that includes things like file system, memory, network, threading, physics, animation, sound, scripting, and so on. So, so lots of stuff. Um, there's like a general philosophy that goes through all of the code that we've tried to follow everywhere. Uh, to begin with, we try to keep the code as simple as possible. Uh, of course, there's always situations where you have to do something complicated because that's the only way to solve a complicated problem. But when you don't need to that, we prefer to keep things as simple as possible for a number of reasons because the most important reason is that simple, simple code is it's easier to understand, which means it's easier to change, which means that as you go into the future, uh, you can optimize that code, you can find different solutions and, and uh, make the code better in the long run. Whereas if you have complicated code, uh, it gets harder and harder to change the code, which means that over time your code gets worse and worse. Uh, so I believe that for, for, for like, like the long-term survival of a project, having simple code is one of the most important things that you can do. Uh, so what do we mean by simple code? What do, it's, it should be easy to read and understand, uh, but more than so, it should be conceptually simple. And what we mean by that is that we try to, to keep the different systems in the end in as decoupled as possible. So there are not a lot of cross dependencies between different systems. And that's really important because that means that when you change something, only that thing will be affected and it won't like uh, break something else further away in the code. Uh, of course, there are, we have a lot of history in the code base and there are places where the code is more coupled than we would, would like maybe, but we always strive for making it as decoupled as possible. Uh, another aspect of simplicity is uh, we do a lot of things linearly, just put everything in a big array in memory and just walk over it. Uh, that's often the simplest way to do things and it's often also the fastest way of doing things since uh, you pay so much for, for cache misses. Uh, another aspect of this is that we use uh, all through the code base, the, this, we use C++, uh, of course, as you know, but it's it's pretty C-like. We don't we don't go very heavy on things like uh, templating and uh, inheritance and uh, STL stuff. And that's again because it's we prefer to keep things simple and we prefer to uh, have control over things. Sometimes when you do things with a lot of of template magic, it can lead to like concise really concise expressions where you can achieve a lot with a few lines of code. Uh, but the drawback of that is when you look at those few lines, you don't really see what's going on behind the scenes. There might be a ton of memory being copied or a ton of uh, function calls happening. Uh, I mean, in the ideal world, uh, as I'm sure you know, some of these abstractions will sort of be canceled out by the compiler and it will all compile down to a few nice assembly instructions if when templates works as they are intended. But 
that doesn't always happen and it's when you just look at the code it's hard to know if that happened or not so we prefer to be explicit and have the code actually written out there so you can see what is happening and you don't have to sort of discover later that oh no this this wasn't like compiled down to some nice assembly it actually expanded to this huge thing um, Niklas, yeah. just a quick question here. So let's say, uh, for example, you, your advice against using something like a std find if or something like that? No, no, we don't. Uh, I actually have talked about that in a future slide. I, I like using the SDL okay. algorithms because the algorithms okay. are, are quite well known. I, we tend to avoid using the, the SDL data structures, but, but I don't mind using, using the algorithms. Okay, okay. thanks. Uh, so, next point here where uh, we have the philosophy of being data-driven, which basically means that we try not to lock down too much in the code, uh, but leave the decisions of how something should be done uh, to the data. And of course, we have a scripting language, Lua, which means that you can do a lot of like operational decisions too uh, in the data, like based on what you want to do, you can do different things. Of course, we have like some decisions in the code. You have to take some some decisions, otherwise you're you're not really making a product. You're just making some abstract platform that can do anything. But but whenever we are like in a situation where we have we don't exactly know what to do, we can push the decision up to the data layer and say that you can specify in the data uh, which way to go. So we're really trying to write something that is as general as possible and can, can be used in a lot of different situations. And I think that's, that's really paid off over the years with BitSquid and Stingray. We've been able to take it in, in different directions uh, uh, without too much effort. Uh, our third, our third uh, point here is that we don't compromise on performance. Uh, by that we mean that we, sh we shouldn't be uh, we shouldn't be constrained by by doing doing something that is that is very unperformant. So if you if you do if you do an update, for example, if in 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 a way that and and this is really connecting back to the data driven thing because if you're if you're doing something in a very expensive way that that sort of limits the application for your product. It might be fine for for one application like a certain user. It doesn't matter if you're unit update is slow because that user will have a thousand units but we're trying to make a very flexible very general product so uh, at some point in the future a user might appear and say like oh i i want to have a hundred thousand units in my game and then su suddenly if we uh, if we didn't uh, <clears throat> think about performance we'll be in trouble so of course this doesn't mean that you should micro optimize everything uh, because that's quite quickly lead to to bad return on your effort but we, we what it means that we do try to keep things uh, linear mostly uh, in the number of things we need to do so if, if we have a, a thousand things that need to move the cost of that should be uh, about a thousand and if we have a thousand things that need to move and a hundred thousand things that are static the cost should still be around a thousand so it, it just by not compromising on performance, that means that it should be related to uh, the effort what we're trying to do. It shouldn't be like we're moving a thousand things and the cost is a million, then, then we have done something badly. Uh, so these are like the things that, that guide most of the code. Um, so next I want to go into like the basic function of the engine, like what happens when when the onion is around, and I know, I know this is well known to a lot of you in this call, but but I tend to this make this presentation useful for people who are just coming into Stingray too. Uh, so, uh, as you know, Stingray Stingray works with resources. That's the that's the data inside the Stingray project, and the resource is identified by its name and its type, and the name is just the path to the resource. Uh, in the project folder and the type is the extension of the resource so uh, the resource can be we have unit resources fbx resources textures and so on and to bring these resources into a running game and actually use them we have a compile step 
so we have source data, which is stored in its own folder. And then we run a compiler, and we end up with compiled data uh, for use by the runtime. So we have a complete separation between the source data and the compiled data. And the reason for that is that they have different requirements. So for the source data, it's nice if it's human readable. It's nice if you can uh, modify it without having to do migration. So it's nice to have formats like JSON where you can add extra keys and it, it doesn't destroy your backwards compatibility. Whereas uh, in the runtime data, the compiled data that we want to use finally, we want that to be as efficient as possible. So we want it packed so it doesn't take much space and we want it to have a nice memory layout and so on. Uh, so we keep them separate. The source data is mostly JSON or our format of JSON, which we call simplified JSON, which is JSON that's a bit easier to write by hand. And you might say, well, what, why does it matter that it's easier to write it by hand? It's because we still have some files that are handwritten, like some of the, uh, some of the render configuration files are, for instance, handwritten. We don't have, we don't have like tools for, for writing those. Uh, and some of the settings files are handwritten too. So for that purpose, it's, it's kind of nice to have one where you don't have to think about putting commas in the right place everywhere. Uh, but, but you could discuss if, it, if that's the right choice or if we should have been like fully JSON compliant everywhere. Yeah, for the, it's nice for merging too because it merges a bit nicer when you don't have to have think about commas at the end of lists. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but then we have some other we have some other file formats too. We have textures and and FBA, some other binary formats that we support. And and the compiled data that is the compiled data is usually a binary blob that we read directly into the memory. So we can just take the data, read it directly from disk into memory, and use it from there. Uh, so we don't need to do any deserialization of the data. We don't need to do any endian conversion and so on. All that is done uh, when we compile. Uh, this is not true for all our formats. Uh, we sort of uh, came to the conclusion over time that this was the right way to do things. So we still have some older uh, resource formats that are this still have a deserialization step, uh, like unit resources, for instance, are still uh, deserialized, but. Uh, we want to fix that going forward. It's not like a super important thing, but um, we would like to get to a state where we use this blob binary data for pretty much everything. Uh, so the, 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 compile, the compiling here is actually done by the engine itself. So the Windows, the Windows executable uh, is the one that's, that compiles this data. Uh, and it does it when you you run it in a special with some special flags. Either you can, either you can you can use some special flags to do one compile, or you can use the uh, asset server flag, which will which will start sort of a server that is capable of compiling projects, but also doing other things. And then you can send commands to that server to tell it to compile data. Uh, and to compile data for other platforms and Windows, that is still done by the Windows executable. So when we compile for other platforms, it, it cross-compiles to those platforms. And compiling and running is, 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 are, are completely separate steps. So what happens when you have a new project uh, is that you first run the compile step and all the data is compiled and then you run it. So the, the runtime doesn't have the capability really of compiling data. And this can be an issue. There are definitely uh, works, workflow situations you could think about where you, it would be nice to have the runtime compile data. For example, suppose you made like an iOS uh, app where you could sort of build things on, on, your, on your iPhone, like build, build a mesh or something, and uh, then it would be nice to compile that mesh so you could use it. But, Currently, we can't do that. The compiling always happens on, on Windows. You could, you could have like a Windows uh, server for doing the compile, compile, so the iOS could talk to that server and get it compiled and get the data back. 
Uh, but it's something to think about like going forward. Do we want to add some compiled compatibilities to, to these other platforms? That might be tricky for some stuff like shaders and stuff like that might, might not even be possible to compile certain platforms. So. Yeah, there's, uh, I think that's definitely would be like a really nice feature, but there's certain dependencies that would be very problematic uh, yeah. in the data comp. So it might be that we only can compile some stuff on, on, on these other platforms, not all of the stuff. But it's something to think about going forward. Uh, the compile is also incremental, which means that when, when you have changes to a project, it will only compile the files that have actually changed and not, not the other files. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, stuff that goes into that to track things like dependencies, like if some file has changed, uh, which files do we need? Which files are dependent on that file and need to be recompiled? And uh, we really want to make sure that we are only compiling just what is needed because compile times for a big project they can start to run away and and compiling extra data is is really wasting our customers' time a lot. So uh, so that's important. Um, so at runtime, uh, the data is managed by uh, the resource manager class. So the way you work with this, this data at runtime is um, you tell the resource manager to load some data into memory. Uh, so you specify the name of resource and the type of the resource to load that data into memory. And it will be loaded by a background thread so we don't stall on loading the data. And once the data has been loaded, uh, there's a get function uh, that lets you request that data out of the system. So uh, this is the resource manager function. There's a lot of other stuff in here too. We'll, we'll go into detail on, on these different areas uh, eventually, but there's a can get function. You can test if a resource is loaded and there's a get function to to fetch a resource, but we'll look at this in more detail later. Um, so we also have a thing called uh, our package system, and and the purpose, the purpose of the package system is really only to group resources, because uh, if you have to deal with resources one by one, it it quickly gets, it quickly gets very uh, complicated because if. If you have a big game project, there might be like 100,000 resources in it. And if you have to think about each one and say, well, I want this texture and I want this unit and I also want this, this thing, then it would like be a huge amount of code and it would be easy to make errors in doing that too. So we have a packaging system where you, in a package file, can define a group of resources and then you can load and unload uh, that group of resources as one thing. So you can say, Oh, get me, uh, get me this uh, group of resources, and it might be a level. And uh, when you define a package, when when a package is compiled, all the dependencies of the resources in the package will be included automatically. So you can make a package where you specify a level, and then everything that that level depends on will will be pulled in together. Uh, uh, this is also uh, when we do our. Uh, when we do our final distribution of, of a product uh, for release, uh, these packages also become uh, bundles, which is a more efficient way of packing the resources. Basically, we just take all the all the resources uh, that belong to a certain package and, and put them in a zip file that we can sort of stream to linearly in memory, so we can load it really fast, which is another uh, useful aspect of, of grouping things. But but even if we didn't do that, we still would kind of need this. I mean, sometimes you, you think about this packaging system and it's, like it's, it's it can be kind of annoying, like why do I have to specify what, what goes where and what I need to load and so on. Can't it just automatically load what I need? Well, you could do that if you never have to throw things out. But if you can't fit everything in memory, you will at some point have to have to throw stuff out and unless you want to deal with throwing out stuff resource by resource, like throw out this texture, throw out this unit, you kind of need this, this grouping mechanism. Uh, yeah, and there's also the issue of um, 
what you need to load and when, because if you don't group things into packages, you just load everything at boot, and then obviously you've got a slow boot time. So yeah. that's that issue as well. But you could do, but you could do, you could do it without the loading. So you could, you could say that like just load, just whenever I request a resource, load it. Of course, that would yeah. kind of create a stall situation. So you would probably want to preload things ahead, and then you're back in into specifying resources and, and needing some kind of package system. Anyway. Um, I have a quick question um, between package and data compilation. If I remember well, everything you put in your source project is data compiled and doesn't depend on uh, whether or not it's part of uh, a specified package, right? No, everything is, everything is compiled. So the compilation happens whether or not it's in the package. Okay. Uh, so, the editor, I'm not going to go into depth uh, about the editors and the tools in, in this series. I focus on the core engine, but just for, for orientation and understanding how everything fits together. Uh, so, the main, the main editor is an HTML5 application that runs in, in Chromium. Uh, there's also a C Sharp editor backend. So, that handle things like view models and stuff like that. So the, uh, so the HTML5 app doesn't talk directly to the engine. Uh, it talks to, to this backend, which has uh, a lot of additional concepts. Uh, this is mostly like a historical residue because we used to have, uh, we used to have the editor written in uh, WPF, in, have the entire uh, editor written in .NET code. And when we moved to HTML, uh, we kind of wanted to, we was, would have been a lot of work to rewrite everything from scratch. So we kept a lot of the stuff from the, from the C sharp code, but it's not really a great solution. It's kind of complicated, uh, having like both things in HTML five and in C sharp and in the engine too. Um, uh, so, uh, I think in the long run, we really want to get get rid of this C-sharp editor backend and just have uh, the HTML code talk directly to the engine and that's, uh, we just have JavaScript and, and engine and that's that's it for the editors. Uh, but that's like kind of an ongoing pro, uh, an ongoing project to, to get that done. So, so in the editor you have some, this is my, my nice rendition. I don't have time to do like nice nice slides for this presentation, so I'm trying to go through the entire engine. So it will be it will be drawings like this. So this is my drawing of the editor. So you have some controls here, and then you have a viewport where you see the, the current scene that you're editing. And the way it works, uh, that viewport is actually the regular engine. So that's the that's the Windows engine that is running in that viewport. And it's running in, in its own window that is positioned on top of the uh, editor window, thanks to some, some Windows API magic from Dan, <laughs> to, the, to find out how to, how to get that to work and get it sorted properly with the other windows. And, and it's, it's moved and sized together with the editor window. So when, when we resize the editor window, we will send messages to resize the engine window. So it looks like the engine window is, is just the part of the editor, it looks like it's embedded in there and and and, and like a regular part of, of the editor, but it's actually its own application and running with its own window. Uh, uh, and this, so we have a we have a nice clear separation between the engine and the editor, and uh, that has big advantages and big drawbacks. Uh, the, the the advantage of this is really the decoupling, and as we said, it's it's been a, it's a really important thing uh, philosophy-wise for the engine to keep things decoupled. And it means this decoupling between the editor and the engine means that the editor doesn't really, uh, there's no like linking of concepts between the editor and the engine. And we could do things like rewriting the editor completely in HTML5 uh, from c, uh, from c .net code, and it didn't really affect the engine at all. We didn't have to do any modifications at all to do that that change in the editor, which is, which is really nice. Um, the drawback is that you have like an additional layer of complexity because, because now you have, you don't have a single application. You have 
uh, an editor and an Indian, and they need to communicate somehow. And the way it works is that they communicate through a WebSocket. So the Indian has a WebSocket server that it opens up, and through that server it accepts uh, commands uh, from the editor. So when the editor wants to do something like the editor wants to spawn a unit in the level or the editor wants to move a unit, it will send uh, a Lua command actually over this WebSocket and tell the Indian, well, move this thing here, and uh, move, uh, move this thing here, and spawn this thing here. Uh, so, so this means that uh, with the C-sharp backend too, <laughs> we, it's kind of a complicated system. We have JavaScript uh, that is running the editor. Uh, we have the C-sharp backend that the editor talks to. Uh, then we has, have Lua code, Lua commands that are sent from the editor to the engine to do stuff. And, and then we have the engine code, which is in C++. So there are a bit too many moving pieces, I would say, in this system for comfort. As I said, the, the, having the separation between Endian and Editor is really nice, but having all these layers can can be like uh, confusing to to find out how how stuff actually gets happened. So we, we definitely want to simplify this, and uh, getting rid of the C sharp backend is one step of simplification. Another step of simplification, which is in process right now, is that uh, instead of depending on uh, on the editor sending explicit Lua commands to the engine to tell it what to do, we want to uh, do it through this asset server project that has been running now for a couple of months where uh, the editor will just send data changes. So it will send, well, I want to update this level file. I want to change the position of this thing in the level file. And then the engine will listen to those changes and, and enact them. So instead of having because this system where you send explicit Lua commands is kind of fragile. It's you have to like mirror the state, and if you if you get out of sync or something like that, it's, it gets bad. So it, I think it will be a simpler system overall to just have um, a central point where all changes get made, and then the engine listens to those changes and and uh, shows shows those changes in the viewport. Uh, but I'll go into that more in in future talk. Uh, so, um, yeah, so the, the editor here reads and writes data uh, in the source folder. So there we have, for example, level files and stuff like that. So when a level is modified, the editor will update that data. And then it will trigger a recompile, and it can also trigger the engine to refresh and, and reload its data from, from the compiled data. So it can modify a um, a level or a particle effect and then and tell the engine to refresh its data and the engine will reload that resource. So one interesting thing about this, the way this is decoupled de between the editor and the engine is that since this mechanism for the editor to talk to the engine is, is just TCP IP uh, or, or web sockets, uh, it means that the editor doesn't have to talk to a local engine on your local machine. Uh, the editor could just as well talk to a remote engine running somewhere else. Uh, so this is what we use to enable the slaving feature, where you can make an, an Android phone or, or an iOS device or, or a console, a PS4 or an Xbox One, um, connect to the editor, and as you edit in the editor, you will see those changes uh, being reflected on, on the phone or, or on the console. Uh, so we can just connect any number of uh, remote viewports up to a running editor and, and see those changes live, which is a, a nice feature. And it's kind of a USP feature for, for Stingray 2. So it's definitely something that we want to keep going. Um, uh, the engine is extensible too. It's extensible through DLLs. Uh, and we use that for a lot of stuff. Uh, navigation is added, added as a DLL. Uh, WISE is added, added as a DLL. Uh, human IK, there's lots and lots of stuff. Yeah, the, yeah, some of them are statically linked for some reasons, but... 
they're isolated and the plan is to move them. And the reason for having this extension system is that there are a lot of people who want to do a lot of things with the engine. And if everything was hacked directly into the engine code, it would quickly turn up super messy. So having this uh, plugin layer is another way of decoupling, decoupling the core engine, which we want to keep nice, well written, uh, from the all the kinds of different like experiments that, that people might want to do with the onion. So we can have that self-contained uh, in its own DLL, whether it's statically linked or dynamically linked. We only support dynamic linking on, on Windows right now. We want to extend that to the other platforms, but yeah, that's future work. But the important thing, more than the way it's linked, the important thing is the isolation between these, these systems. Uh, the only thing that I wish was a it was a plugin that isn't his physics. <laughs> yes, definitely. It would be really nice if we could just swap physics back in by, uh, by changing a plugin. Yeah, so we, we definitely have, I mean, the plugin system got implemented like a year ago or something like that. So, so we have a lot of legacy stuff that maybe if we'd done it today, we would have done it as a plugin. But since it was done uh, before we had that system, it's, it's built into the core engine. And uh, the interface between the engine and the plugins is, is C based. So it's not C++, it's pure C. And the reason for that is that uh, C++, there is no like ABI uh, compatibility layer for C++. Different compilers produces different things. And it's just, it's, it's nicer with C than, than everything works automatically. And it's based on a system where you, you query for interfaces. So if you want, um, so an interface in this, an interface is essentially a struct with C function pointers, functions that you can call to do stuff. And you get that, you get that struct by calling a um, get API function. So you pass in an identifier for the API and you get back a struct with, uh, with function pointers. So we can look into this file. Uh, that defines uh, the plugin API. Uh, yeah. So here are IDs that identify all the different APIs that are exposed by the engine. So you call one of these, uh, you call the get API function with one of these identifiers, and then you get back. There are some common data definitions here too, but you get back something like I'll scroll down. Uh, yeah, here's the Lua API, for instance, where you can add new Lua functions to the engine. So you get back a struct like this with function pointers, then you can just call those function pointers to call into the engine. And, and this is really the, the only thing that we share between the plugins and the engine. We don't do any attempt to share things like collection clauses or, or, uh, or stuff like that, that, that we have in the engine. Uh, Again, because of decoupling, it's, it's better to keep that isolated so that if we want to change the collection clauses in the engine in some way or do some other change, uh, it doesn't break all the plugins. So if you want things like vectors and hash maps in the plugins, uh, you do that you, uh, isolated in the plugin. So the plugin has their own definitions of that. And we actually have a, uh, we have like, a, what's it called, the plugin? Yeah, the plugin foundation, which is like a, a set of headers that you can use in your plugins to get things like collection classes and so on. Uh, but but then you get your own copy of that code. It's not shared with the engine implementation of those classes. Uh, um, a um, quick question about something else we could share, maybe. Um, you know, we... we, we if your plugin tends to be a, a big one, you know, a meaty one, um, you we'll often use a back object, you know, to, yeah. back, to pass back and forth. Um, and to make that, you know, uh, robust to errors, uh, it would be nice to have this kind of tag that says, oh, this is of this type. Um, yeah. It would be, do you think that we can think of uh, a, a pattern that says um, the four uh, first byte of uh, no pack object uh, yeah, we, is something, and uh, we only have a, we already have a pattern like that actually. 
So yeah, uh, so I, think, I know. Yeah, so I think we. Should, and we, my question is: Do you think we can extend that to the plugin and maybe reserve some kind of uh, uh, beat feel or uh, um, ranges in in a, in a Uint uh, thirty two bits to say this is reserved to this plugin or this is reserved to SD engine and stuff like that? Yeah, I I think we. Uh, I'm trying to find some example of a class that, that has this. <laughs> um. The only thing I don't like about that approach is that it means that you either have to start embedding that into your SDK objects on the plugin side, yeah. uh, or using dummy objects that encapsulate the actual SDK objects, so it's not ideal. It's not ideal, but if you can do it, and navigation can do it, it can be just an additional layer of uh, safety, right? Yeah. So, so I mean, the way it, the way it's oh, I can't find a, an example. Uh, so the the way it, the way it works right now is that the first four bytes in in a lot of classes, not everywhere, but in a lot of a lot of classes, the first four bytes are used as a tag that identifies the type of a pointer, and and we actually use that because because uh, when we bind to Lua, we use light user data rather than user data which means we have no type information stored in Lua. So to find the type of the object, we just take the pointer um, and look at the first four bytes. And if the first four bytes, uh, we match that with these different tags that, that we have for different types. Yeah, the view for, yeah, the, view for the same problem that Kieran has, because in the navigation plugin, we're almost always using light data. So yeah, that's the same. So, so I think we should use the same mechanism. Currently, we don't have any, we don't have any registry for those four bytes. We just uh, whenever someone needs them, they they randomize four bytes and use them. So there's some risk of collision. Like if we start to have ten thousand of these different types, and then we might run into a collision. So I'm not sure. It's kind of nice to yeah. It's, it's this big debate: is it better to just use something random or to have like a big registry? Like maintaining a registry is kind of a pain in the ass. On the other hand, with random, you you have a risk of collision. On the other hand, if you find a collision, it's not that super big deal you can just one of you have to change your your identifier no no not not this it could be a completely different yeah. system so you never pass like a sound into navigation for instance so so it might not even be an issue it's true um right so yeah and, and it works this is for for getting the interfaces the engines interfaces, but it works the same way uh, for the plugins. So the plugins have APIs that the engine can query for and, and call into the plugin. So it's, it's exactly the same mechanism. Yeah, and plugins can go call into other plugins too by requesting their API through the ID. And there's an extension system in the editor as well. Uh, I won't go into that, but the plan is you can make an extension that has editor components and engine components. Uh, to write uh, code for your game or for your project, whatever it is, you have a, a number of different options. You can write it using a plugin DLL, uh, using this, this API, you can uh, write stuff like that. Uh, more common is to script it with Lua. Uh, so we have a Lua API, which is based on top of the C API. Uh, not 100% on top of the C API. Dan is working on that right now. It used to be we didn't have we had the Lua API before we had the C API. So the Lua API talked directly to the engine, but now we're rewriting it so that the Lua API will go through the C API. And the reason for that is that we want a single API to the engine. So the C API will be the engine's API, and then the Lua API is on top of that. And you could also add other scripting languages if you wanted to. Uh, you could use FEF, FFI bindings for Python or JavaScript or whatever your favorite language is and just bind that to our C API and uh, you could use the engine with a different scripting language. Now I don't think we should recommend that because I think we should have a single scripting language uh, that is our, our recommendation because otherwise we're just fragmenting the user base and documentation will be hard and so on. But uh, it's nice to say there might be some customers who are like really in love with a particular language where it fits into their pipeline or whatever, and then it's nice to be able to offer that while well, you can actually do stuff in this language too. 
And it might be like for uh, for the editor that already uses JavaScript, it might be maybe it should talk to the engine using JavaScript instead of Lua. So it's something that could be could be interesting in the future. Uh, and then there's Flow, which is our visual scripting language, um, similar to other visual scripting languages. You connect boxes that um, connect uh, variables between different nodes and and uh, actions between different nodes. I talk more about that later, but it gets compiled into kind of a bytecode. I'm sure I would actually call it the bytecode, but it's a binary representation of the flow diagram that we can interpret at runtime. Uh, so that's how you build your project. Um, uh, well, this this first talk is, is a bit a lot of different things, but I want to cover the, all the basics. Uh, we have a build system that. The build that builds the engine, it's CMake based. So there's a lot of CMake files for building the different components of the engine. Uh, uh, the CMake will generate project files for the different platforms. And once you have the project files, you can, of course, build from within Visual Studio uh, or Xcode or whatever, and debug from in there and use the debugger and all stuff like that. But you need to run CMake first uh, in order to generate the project files. Or you can build the whole thing through CMake and not. Not uh, not use uh, Visual Studio if you don't if you don't need to. Um, there's a Ruby front end to CMake just to make it a bit easier to to build the engine in a particular configuration, and that's the Make Ruby script. So you call that and you pass in some flags that tells uh, tells the script what you want to build if it's the engine or the editor and for what platform and what configuration and so on. Um, for libraries, we use the Stingray package manager called SPM. It was written a couple of years, two years, one year, two years ago. Um, that's uh, so SPM essentially just parses a package file uh, that looks like this. So package file uh, defines an S3 bucket uh, to download packages from. Um, we can also download from, from Git or Artifactory or other stuff, but we're only using S3 internally. And then it, it has like um, names of all the different packages, and they, they also can belong to groups. So you can bring in, uh, for example, all the packages that you need for, for the engine. They are in the engine group and so on. And they have a platform flag, so certain packages are for certain platforms. Uh, but basically, it just points out a certain file in the S3 repository. So the uh, so when you when you run the make Ruby script, it will figure out what packages you need in order to build this configuration. It call SPM, and SPM will fetch down and install those packages in your library folder, and then you're ready to go. So you don't have to you don't have to install any packages by hand. The only handheld step you really need is to install like Visual Studio and your compilers. But it's all it's all described in the README. Yeah, and Ruby it needs to be installed. There is some bootstrap steps. It would like would be nice to get rid of all the bootstrap steps and just have like one thing you click and you're ready to go. But we'll see. <laughs> it's it gets increasingly more difficult <laughs> the more the more steps you want to remove. Um, so platforms in the onion. Uh, we currently have Win32, Xbox One, Android, OS X. We don't actually build the engine for OS X, but we still have the flags there for to be able to do that in the future. iOS, PS4, WebGL, and Linux. You build for a specific platform with Make and, and just pass in the platform. Uh, in the code, there's defines for the different platforms. Uh, so we can take different code paths based on the platform. Each platform has its own data folder. So when we're compiling the data, you will compile the data for a specific platform, and you will end up with a data folder uh, that contains the compiled files uh, for, for that platform. Now, Xbox One and PS4 are kind of special because uh, they are secret platforms or closed platforms, which means that uh, the code for that platform, to see the code for that platform, uh, you need to be a licensed developer for Xbox One or PS4, and that includes, I mean, you would think that what we do in our engine is mostly like 
just binding to their API calls, but that's still secret. Their what calls exist in their SDK is secret. So we have to separate that out from the other code. And the way we do that is that we keep we keep that code in sub repositories. So we have an Xbox One and a PS4 sub repository, and only customers that have access to Xbox One and PS4 are able to access uh, that those repositories. And this means that if you do a change in the engine that that affects um, the Xbox One and the PS4 code, you have to like uh, you have to be careful when you commit it because you have to commit it both to the sub repositories and the main repos. There are instructions for that, but that's something to think about. As I said before, only Windows can compile data on of these other platforms. Uh, when we run on these run on these platforms, we usually run in what we call file client mode, and um, that means that. Uh, we start a file server locally on the PC. And we do that by giving the asset server command and some, some secret uh, password. And the file server is actually the same as the data compiler server. Like we use that argument too to start, start the server for data compiles. And then we launch the runtime uh, on, the, on the platform where we want to run it. And we specify a host where, where the file server is running and matching secret and the data directory that we want to load. And then the data will be streamed over TCP from the file server to the client. And this avoids us from having to copy the data uh, to the device every time we want to run, which, which tends to be like a pain in the ass and take a lot of time. Uh, we can deploy the data locally to run, to run locally on the device, but usually we don't do that because it's just, it's just painful to do that. And, Running over the file server is it's pretty fast. It's not super fast, depending on the platform. Android and stuff are, are, are a bit slow to stream data over the network. But, but we also have a cache for that, so it will, you only have to stream it once. Um, so the runtime, the main, the main sort of hub for the runtime code is in application CPP. And what happens when you uh, when you run the engine, it's typically first it will load the settings ini file for for the product you're running, which uh, specifies a lot of a lot of system set settings. Then it will initialize all the different systems in the engine, systems like threading, files, resources, the renderer, a lot of different systems that need initialization. Once all those systems are up and running, uh, we call back into Lua uh, to the init function. So if you're Project has defined an init function, and and the settings init point, points out the Lua file to load for your project. So that's how we know which Lua file to to load to look for these functions. Uh, so then your your Lua code can do whatever initialization is needed from Lua. And once that is done, we go into the update update loop. Uh, we update timers. We update this uh, console server connection or TCP IP connection to get commands from the editor, stuff like that. Uh, we update our system windows. Um, we update input from uh, input controllers. There are other various system updates. I haven't listed them all here, but, but a lot of different, all the systems that needs to pump, be pumped with an update. Uh, then we call uh, into Lua again, the update function in Lua. And Lua uh, in turn calls back into the engine Lua, Lua does its own update, that's up to the project on what they want to do. And Lua calls back into the engine to update some other systems, like for example, game worlds. Uh, we don't update all the game worlds by default because Lua may create game worlds that are kind of dormant, that are not used right now, and then we don't have to update those. So Lua controls which worlds are getting updated. And then there's a render callback into Lua, and Lua calls a render world to render certain worlds. That's Again, that's controlled by the Lua. Not all the worlds have to be rendered. Uh, and the actual rendering happens on, on the render thread. It's a separate, separate thread uh, where the rendering calls get processed. And this update loop keeps going and, um, until Lua requests to quit the engine. And then there's a call to shutdown in Lua, where Lua can sort of clean up, do any necessary cleanup of 
of systems and and that's it um, I wanted to go into memory a bit too I don't know if we should take a short break let's take a five-minute break and then we'll talk a bit about memory All right